Alrighty, so the problem of Socrates. You know, you've you've probably been asking yourself, ha ha ha, what is Socrates' problem? Well, Nietzsche is going to uh, address that question, right? and he starts off like this: Concerning life, the wisest men of all ages have judged alike. It's no good. Always and everywhere one has heard the same sound from their mouths, a sound full of doubt, full of melancholy, full of weariness of life, full of resistance to life. Even Socrates said as he died, to live, that means to be sick a long time. Even Socrates was tired of it. What does that evidence, what does that evince? Formerly one would have said, oh, it has been said, and loud enough, and especially by our pessimists, that something of all must be, uh, something of all this must be true. Consensus of the sages evinces, uh, evidences the truth. Shall we uh, talk like that today? May we? At least something must be sick here, we retort. These wisest men of all ages, they should first be scrutinized closely. Were they all perhaps, uh, were they all perhaps shaking on their legs, late, tottery, decadence? Could, <clears throat> could it be that wisdom appears on the earth as a raven, inspired? by a little whiff of Karen. So you can see a different kind of critique coming from Nietzsche here right off the bat. Right? As, as we've seen from the, the, what we've talked about in the previous video, Nietzsche is going to be offering a dispositional critique. It's going to be asking not whether these beliefs are true or false, as, as, as Roderick points out in one of his videos, I think it's on Nietzsche on truth and lie, right? Um, <clears throat> Nietzsche is, in a sense, just not playing that truth game, right? He's not going to be asking whether these beliefs are true, whether they're justified, whether the arguments are valid, right? He's rather going to be asking a different kind of question. You believe this, what are the consequences of that belief? Right? The con in, in, in terms of the psychological consequences of that belief. If you believe this, what sort of disposition to your life is that going to foster? Right? And more than that, what Nietzsche wants to argue is that to a certain extent, right, and it, for what he wants to argue, and we'll see why he wants to argue this, right, but nonetheless, right, what, what he wants to argue, right, is that the previous thousands of years of Western philosophy have perpetuated a metaphysical belief system that encourages us to deny rather than affir our affirm our lives. It judges this life here now as we live it. It judges all of the tackle that comes along with that. Our senses, our body, uh, suffering, etc., etc., etc. To be altogether a bad thing. Right? You can see what we've, what we've looked at before to this point with Nietzsche. This is going to be the ground for a critique of those belief systems. If you believe this, then you must hate life. This is the criticism that he's just issued among these great sages. It's not that they agree and that means something must be true here. Right? They agree in some physiological and some psychological and some fundamental sort of respect that has them adopt a negative attitude towards life. All right. Now, what Nietzsche points out, right, um, it's on page 474, and this is, I, I think, the passage that so fundamentally sort of sets up the rest of Nietzsche's argument here, right? Where shall I start? Uh, regarding the consensus of the sages on 474. The consensus of the sages, I comprehend this even more clearly, proves least of all that they were right in what they agreed on. It shows rather that they themselves, these wisest men, agreed in some physiological respect and hence adapt, adopted the same 
negative attitude towards life, had to adopt it. Judgments, judgments of value concerning life, for it or against it, can, in the end, never be true. They have value only as symptoms. They are worthy of consideration only as symptoms in themselves. Such judgments are stupidities. One must stretch out one's fingers and make an attempt to grasp the amazing finesse that the value of life cannot be estimated, not by the living, for they're an interested party, even a bone of contention, and not by and not judges, not by the dead, for a different reason. Right. So what Nietzsche is arguing here is something similar to this. I happen to not like pickles. I just don't like them. Is there anything true about that statement? Right. Are pickles therefore bad? No, they aren't. Let's say nine out of ten people agree that pickles are yucky and we don't like them. That rests at the level of judgment. It's still not true that pickles are bad, it's just we agree in some matter of taste. Right? We agree in some physiological respect rather than this providing evidence for the truth of our claim that pickles are bad. Right? What effectively we've shown is our disposition, our tastes, our preferences. Right? It shows us not something about pickles, but something about us. Right? So, it's very, very sort of similar. It's Remember way back in the, uh, the Socrates uh, material, I was going a little bit through the Euthyphro, right? Um, and and uh, Euthyphro was trying to explain what piety is, right? Well, piety is what pleases the gods. Hmm, that's interesting. I like ice cream. Did that tell you anything about ice cream? Right? Judgments of light about life operate in the sort of the same way. Life is no good, right? And that is the starting point to your philosophy, right? That is the fundamental consequence of your metaphysics, right? It tells you not something about the value of life, but rather something about your disposition, about the theorist's disposition towards life, right? Value judgments operate in this manner. Now, what Nietzsche does next is he turns to um, sort of an ad hominem attack against Socrates here. Right? It, it seems as though what Nietzsche is doing is attacking the arguer rather than his argument. Right? In origin, Socrates belonged to the lowest class. Socrates was a ble plebe. We know uh, we uh, we know we can see uh, still see for ourselves how ugly he was, but ugliness in its in itself an objection is among the Greeks almost a refutation. Was Socrates a Greek at all? Ugliness is often an expression of uh, of a development that has been crossed thwarted by crossing, or it appears as declining a, a, a development. Anthropologists among criminologists tell us that the typical criminal is ugly, right? <clears throat> blah 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 blah, right? So to a certain extent, it seems seems as though Nietzsche is providing an attack against the person rather than his argument that he might be guilty of an ad hominem fallacy here, right? But it is up to something a little bit more clever. Effectively, what Nietzsche is doing here, and if I had to rename this section, I might rename it the Curious Case of Socrates. Right? Because, according to Nietzsche, Socrates was able to do something very strange, very different, and this section is an analysis of Socrates trying to understand how this ugly, lower-class, smelly, barefoot kook from the streets of Athens was able to so fundamentally change the way that Western culture values. A whole different value structure, according to Nietzsche, was present 
in Athenian culture. This is the, the, the nucleus, the seed from which Western culture grew. Uh, the Greeks through to the Romans, through to the Renaissance revival, through etc. etc. Et uh, it's these Greeks are where we get the notion of democracy from. These Greeks are where we get the Olympics from. These Greeks, etc. 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 Most of our values and a whole host of our cultural practices come from these Greeks. Right? So that Socrates, this suffice to say, a typical representation of Greekness, right? because a wealth obsessed culture, right? It, in the port city of Athens, right, where it, it, you don't get architecture like we see from I I Athens. Right, it, without being a little bit materialistic and wealth obsessed, right? Socrates was the not diametrically opposed to that, right? Now, beauty obsessed, right? They deified beauty in the physical form, right? I told you about the statues that Alcibiades <coughs> decapitated as a celebratory method on the way into it was health and natural vitality, virility, beauty, physical stature, the physical form that was idealized and we've got this crooked nose, smelly, plebeian, ugly, ugly, ugly old coot, right, who has become such a prominent figure in Athenian culture. And basically Nietzsche wants to ask what the hell happened where Socrates, this crazy person, right? This person who had these auditory hallucinations, remember his daemon chirping in his ear, right? Was able to fundamentally change the way that Athens believed and valued. How did that happen, right? So, on 475, Nietzsche points out, and this is kind of important, we'll come back to it a little bit later, right? Um, was Socrates a typical criminal? At least that would not have been uh, contradicted by the famous judgment of a physiognomist, which sounded so offensive to the friends of Socrates. A foreigner who knew about faces once passed through Athens and told Socrates that, to his face, that he was monstrous more or less, that he harbored in himself all of the bad vices and appetites, and Socrates merely answered, you know me, sir. Right? So even by Socrates' own account, right, he was, to the Athenians, monstrous. Right? Now, what Nietzsche wants to suggest is that, well, Socrates was sort of an extreme case. Socrates was sort of typical in terms of the drives and appetites of the Athenians. He argues on 475, Socrates' decadence is suggested not only by the admittant wantonness of an anarchy of his instincts, but by uh, the hypertrophy of the logical faculty and that sarcasm of the radic which distinguishes him. Let me just decode that a little bit. It, Socrates had like a ludicrously sort of hyperactive logical factory, uh, faculty. We've, we've seen this from his arguments, right? The kinds of arguments that he'd get in with uh, the, the, the average person on the street, with the famous people from the streets, from the most prominent Athenians, were extremely, almost ludicrously logical. Right, and that sarcasm of the radic, the sarcasm of the radic related to rickets, which means it's sort of a diseased sarcasm. Certainly, Socrates can be seen as a sarcastic creature. Right, I mean, who up against the death penalty suggests that he should be put up in the Britannium, given free lunches, rather than the death penalty at the moment of sen sentencing? Right? It's, there's, there's an element of sarcasm there. So we see in Socrates these strange traits. Nietzsche continues, nor should we forget those auditory hallucinations which Socrates um, have interpreted religiously. Um, everything in him is exaggerated. Buffo, a character 
everything at the same time concealed ulterior subterranean. I seek to comprehend what idiosyncrasy begot that Socr uh, Socratic equation of virtue and happiness, that most bizarre of all equations, which moreover is opposed to the inst instincts of the earlier Greeks. What Nietzsche is pointing out here is that the old noble taste of the Athenians was vanquished upon Socrates' arrival. Right? The old noble taste, which would not present you with reasons for position or anything along those lines, but would be simply an expression of power. If you had power that you were able to express it, right, was it, it, sort of the simple virtue of the ancient Greeks. Right? Generally, if you had the power and were able to express it, right, that would be a fairly the idea is just being able to, in a sense, use their power to get what you want, right? This was the old Athenian taste, right? So the powerful, the prominent people in Athens were very used to getting what they want and would not need to explain themselves, especially to this crazy old coot, this plebe on the street. Picture it like the mayor of your city bumping into a homeless person and being asked to get into an argument with that homeless person, right? And generally, they'd have handlers to present uh, prevent that sort of thing. I mean, Roderick uses in the Socrates video the example of, you know, federal politicians. Um, God, I think it was like Dan Quayle that he was referring to. Those videos are old. Right, uh, you know, getting sucked into an hour-long argument about democratic justice or something along those lines. Right, it just would not happen. Right, so <clears throat> what Nietzsche is pointing out, right, by this old Athenian taste is, um, he says on 476, honest things like honest men do not carry their reason in their hands like that. It's indecent to show all five fingers. What must first be proved is worth little. Wherever authority still forms part of good bearing, where one, where one does not give reasons but commands, the dialectician is a kind of buffoon. One laughs at him. One does not take him seriously. Socrates was a buffoon who got himself taken seriously. What really happened here? Right? What really happened that turned the offering of reasons for your actions and your activities into a thing. Right? Why is this a thing? All of a sudden with Socrates, right up to Socrates, it wasn't a thing. But suddenly with Socrates, the Athenian taste changed. Right? So what Nietzsche points out here is that Generally, dialectics is the last refuge of someone with no weapons left. Right. It's an important point, and it, I'll see if I can't illustrate this here. Nietzsche claims, again, 476, nothing is easier to erase than a dialectical effect. Experience of every meeting at which there are speeches proves this. It can, be, <clears throat> it can only be self-defense for those who ha no longer have other weapons. One must have to enforce one's right until one reaches that point. One makes no use of it. Right? So effectively dialectics, right? Nietzsche is claiming here nothing is easier to erase than a dialectical effect. I used to get into arguments with a friend of mine. He wanted to study environmental philosophy and he was concerned about making reasoned arguments in favor of environmental protection. Right? Uh, you know, Eventually, after four years of studying environmental philosophy in his undergrad, he wound up extremely frustrated with making sort of normative, political, and moral arguments about how the environment should be protected, etc., etc., etc. Because what he points out is that every intelligent, reasoned person understands. We're preaching to the choir. We already understand that there are these moral arguments in place here, yet nothing 
happens. Nothing substantive. Nothing sufficient. Only the most bare minimum in order to politically satisfy the masses actually occurs. And when those arguments can be loopholed around, when those laws that are enacted can be loopholed around, right, this occurs. And when those laws become inconvenient in terms of money, in terms of politics, they're, as a matter of course, just repealed or just plain old not enforced. Uh, actual practice flies in the face of them. Look at the Bloody Knock Brothers and their, their piles and piles of bitumen that blew into and across the Detroit River into Windsor. It was sitting there for ages. Right? Look at the bloody oil sands in Canada. This is dirty, dirty. It's the most inefficient, dirty, polluting way to extract fossil fuel. Right? Yet, it's still in practice because there's gobs and gobs and gobs of money to be made, even though just about every Canadian who's not an interested party who understands the process is against it. Entire provinces have said, no, you're just not bringing it across here, with no ability to really affect the, you know, arguments themselves are not enough. Right? I remember I was at a conference at one point, right, and, you know, we were, we were talking about the importance of, importance of social practice and being a good citizen and actually building one's city and one's state and it, it, that sort of thing. Right, and somebody had pre presented just a knockdown argument, right, that tied in environmental philosophy as well, and, and frankly, the argument itself was a beautiful product. But what about belligerent people? What about belligerent people? People that see your argument and just don't give a damn. I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want because I'm making money while doing it. What about those big corporations that say, ah, to hell with it, I'm just going to pollute. You can find me, I'm going to make more money than that anyway. Right? What about large corporations that don't do recalls, even though they know that people are going to die as a result of design flaws in their vehicles, etc., etc., etc.? dialectical effects are easy to ignore. Argument alone does not produce social change. We know this today. The Athenians knew this back then. Yet, somehow, dialectics with Socrates became king. Section 7, 476. The irony is the irony of Socrates an expression of result, revolt, of plebeian resentment? Does, does he, as one opposed, um, or, or, sorry, as one oppressed, enjoy his own ferocity in the knife thrust, uh, the thrusts of his syllogism? Does he avenge himself on the noble people whom he fascinates, a dialectician? As a dialectician, one holds a merciless tool in one's hand. One can become a tyrant by means of it. One compromises those one, uh, one conquers, a dialectician leaves it to his opponent to prove that he is no idiot. He makes one furious and helpless at the same time. The dialectician renders the intellect um, of his opponent powerless indeed. Is di uh, dialectic only a form of revenge in Socrates? The interesting thing about dialectics is that anyone who knows is somebody who is a formidable arguer that puts you on the spot with arguments knows that the second you get drawn into an argument with these people you wind up looking like a fool because this person has an argument in place they've thought it through and what you have to do is catch up and backpedal and all the while the person you're arguing with is not making a claim to 
know what the right answer, what the truth is, all they're doing is criticizing your position and showing that you don't know what the heck you're talking about. It's frustrating. And, and what Nietzsche is suggesting here is that especially somebody like Socrates, for somebody like Socrates, dialectics becomes a form of revolt, revenge, and an expression of resentment. If we think what resentment is, right, think about the last time you've resented something somebody said, right? or you've resented the fact that somebody did something. Right? Did you in that case have the power to affect some sort of change, to actually redress the situation in terms of power, or is your resentment the, the result of a will that can't express itself? Right? See, this is the key for Nietzsche. Passions that aren't able to express themselves outwardly turn inward and invent an imaginary revenge for themselves. Right? So, like the people that make moral arguments about power structures or inequities within their distribution of wealth or environmental policy and that sort of thing and make these fiery fiery arguments they're making these arguments because they cannot affect the real change they're making these arguments in the place of acting in the world to change the way that we actually practice. Right? So, more or less, what Nietzsche is arguing of Socrates is that, especially in his case, and I started off by saying especially in his case, especially in the case of this poor, ugly, fairly socially isolated, hallucinating kook that did not fit the mold of Athenian society. We, we, we know that plays were written that made him look like a buffoon. He was made fun of. People warned their children, stay away from crazy old Socrates. Well, the kind of psychological and physiological resp uh, response that one would expect from somebody who's made fun of in this manner might be resentment in an attempt to get some form of revenge. Right. So largely what Nietzsche is hypothesizing is perhaps that given that dialectics were so poorly thought of, Socrates' use of them might have been an, an expression of resentment and an attempt to get some form of imagined revenge, right? Even if that person winds up winning the day, even if they're wealthy and powerful and good-looking and have all the stuff, right? I'm still right. You're wrong, I'm right, and I can be satisfied with that, and I'm going to point out to anybody who will listen how wrong you are, right? So, right, rather than a virtue, and these sort of saintly sort of attitudes towards the argument that we generally ascribe to Socrates, what Nietzsche is suggesting is perhaps there might be some other psychological reason, right? And interestingly, as I've got up on the board, I've just put some important terms, like some important ideas, sort of in the order that they come here, right? What Socrates did is he invented a new agon, a new contest, a new fencing match for Athens. And this is why it fascinated, right? Nietzsche suggests, because it's essentially an erotic activity. It's just like the Olympics, right? Watching somebody race a chariot or somebody enter into a sword fight or something along those lines. Dialectics works a lot like that. There's a winner and there's a loser and everybody can gather around in a crowd, as we know they did around Socrates, and watch it happen, right? So he invented a new fencing match and became its first fencing master. Uh, 
Now, interestingly, what Nietzsche points out here is that it's not all just Socrates' revenge and resentment at work here. Right? Effectively, what Socrates did is he changed the noble taste of Athenians away from a fairly simple expression of power, right? being able to get what you want, right? towards dialectics. Right? He suggested motives other than those virtuous motives, right? but pointing out that effectively what Nietzsche did, or Nietzsche, Socrates did, was invent a new contest for the Athenians. Right? And this fascinated, on the basis of the erotic, these Athenians. Right? Now, what Nietzsche is about to suggest is Athens needed Socrates. 477, and Socrates understood that all the world needed him, his means, his cure, his personal artifice of self-preservation. Everywhere the instincts were in an anarchy. Everywhere one was within five paces of excess. Monstrousness was a general da danger. Right? The impulses want to play tyrant. One must invent a counter tyrant who is stronger. When the physiognomist had revealed to Socrates who he was, a cave of bad appetites, remember from earlier I mentioned. The great master of irony let slip another word, <clears throat> which is the key to his character. It's true, he said, but I've mastered them all. How did Socrates become master over himself? His case was, at bottom, merely an extreme case, only the most striking instance of what was then be, uh, beginning um, to be a universal distress. No one was any longer master over himself. The instincts turned against each other. He fascinated <clears throat> being this extreme case. His awe-inspiring ugliness proclaimed him as such to all who could see. He fascinated, of course, even more as an answer, as a solution, as an apparent cure of this case. Now, I mentioned when we were studying Socrates that, you know, interestingly, Athens well suddenly became an extremely wealthy city-state, right? As though overnight, right? What they did is they found a vein of silver down the way. It went to war, got some slaves, had the slaves mine the silver, and then all of a sudden they're fabulously wealthy. This is where all, the, all of the architecture comes from. This is how they built their great trading navy, right? And this is how they became sort of a port town, right? The, a trading center, right? So effectively, right, Athens was the best mall, right? Uh, the, 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 the banker's tables and the market square where Socrates would make his arguments right, were effectively the best bloody mall in the world. If it was findable in the world, likely you would find it in Athens, right, in the market district. Hmm, I'm looking for silk from the other side of the world. Check the market in Athens. Right? I'm looking for some pottery, I'm looking for jewelry, I'm looking for rare foods, I'm looking for, it's if it was findable, it would be there, and this is all sort of a byproduct of the extreme and very sudden wealth of the Athenians. What happens when you become fabulously wealthy, as though overnight? Well, you get overwhelmed by it. All of your instincts, there's nothing to oppose your drives. You want a thing, you buy the thing, you've got the thing. You don't want the thing anymore, you want something else. You buy it, etc., etc., etc. Generally, nature imposes a certain degree of control over your instincts, your drives, and your desires due to scarcity and the limits in your ability to satisfy them. Not so with the wealthy new Athenians. Their drives were just in chaos. Right? They could have whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted it. So they wanted this, they wanted that, they wanted the other thing. And they were just led by their short leash, their short chain of their desires. And we saw, democratically, this made them do bloody, stupid things. We saw, politically, this made them do 
bloody, stupid things one can imagine. Socially and culturally, they were doing bloody, stupid things. All right? So, what Nietzsche is arguing here is that Socrates saw in himself and in the Athenians this anarchy of the drives. All right? He started off that section that I was quoting, but Socrates guessed, uh, guessed even more. He saw through his noble Athenians. He comprehended that his own case, his idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy was no longer exceptional. The same kind of degradation was quietly developing every war, everywhere. Old Athens was coming to an end. Right? So what Socrates positioned himself as, and we saw this from reading the Apology, was sort of a cultural physician. Right? Here, Athens is sick. Here, let me present you with a solution. And what was his solution? We know from our study of Socrates was that, you know, we should be persuaded by reasons. We should reason to our conclusions. We shouldn't opine, we shouldn't desire, we shouldn't put that in the forefront. Rather, we should put reason in the forefront. So as Nietzsche notes on 478, when one finds it necessary to turn reason into a tyrant, as Socrates did, the danger cannot be slight, that something else will play the tyrant. Rationality was then hit upon as savior. Neither Socrates nor his patients had any choice about being <coughs> rational. It was the fashion. It was their last resort. The fascination <coughs> with which all Greek uh, reflection throws itself upon rationality uh, betrays a desperate situation. There was danger. There was <coughs> but one choice, either perish or to be absurdly rational. The moralism of the Greek philosophers from Plato on is pathologically conditioned, so is their esteem for dialectics, reason, virtue, happiness. That means merely that one must imitate Socrates and counter the dark appetites with permanent daylight, the daylight of reason. One must be clever, clear, bright at any price. Any concession to the instincts, to the unconscious, leads downward. Right? So Socrates' solution, so the passions, the desires, want to play tyrant. Well, what we have to do is invent a counter-tyrant. We should not listen to our passions or desires or opinions, but rather use reason instead. One problem with that with Nietzsche. Reason is just a, a tool of the passions, and it's, it's an expression of the very passions that it's trying to control. He continues, I have given to understand how it was that Socrates fascinated. He seemed to be a physician, a savior. Is it necessary to go on to demonstrate the error in his faith in rationality at any price? It's a self-deception on the part of philosophers and moralists that they believe that when they are extricating themselves from decadence, when they merely wage war against it, extrication lies beyond their strength. What they choose as means, as salvation, is itself another expression of decadence. They change its expression, but they do not get rid of decadence itself. Socrates was a misunderstanding. The whole improvement morality, including the Christian, was a misunderstanding. The most blinding daylight, rationality at any price, life, bright, cold, cautious, conscious, without instinct, in opposition to the instincts, all this too is a mere disease, another disease, and by no means a return to virtue, to health, to happiness, to have to fight the ins instincts. That is the formula of decadence. As long as life is ascending, happiness equals instincts. Right? So, by a couple of things going on. Right? First off, there's a problem with your passions if you can't express your passions. Right? There's a problem with your instincts if your instincts are leading you astray. Right? 
the Athenians found that there was a problem with their instincts. They were in anarchy, they were in disarray, they were decadent. Right? So rather than reining them in, rather than as what Nietzsche is about to suggest in the last video, which is the spiritualization of our passions, the sorting out, the thinking through, the maturing of our passions, by rather opposing reason to the passions, by saying that all of the passions must obey reason, what we are doing every time we have a passion is subjecting it to reason and acting on reason rather than our passions. What we do is we become systematizers rather than vital, healthy, living things. What Nietzsche is suggesting here, to have to fight against the instincts, that's the, fight, uh, the formula for decadence, it puts us in a constant losing battle against our passions. Losing battle because reason is just simply one of those passions. It's a very similar position to Hobbes. Reason is just a tool of desire, right? So we have a desire and we use reason to figure out how best to satisfy that desire, right? How do we come to know anything at all? What's the first thing we have to do? Give a damn. We have to care. We have to be passionate about it. Think about why you study the sorts of things that you study in school. You're passionate about it. You care. You give a damn. And then you exercise the faculty of reason as a tool of your desires. Right? So effectively, reason can't control the passions. It's a tool of the passions. And what's more, to have to control those passions, that's already the problem. Right? So effectively, Socrates' solution to the Athenian question, to turn reason into a tyrant, right? Effectively, it's a bait and switch. Right? Here, your passions are in disarray. Here, try reason instead. Uh, reason's just another one of those passions. So, effectively, you got me to buy something other than the passions, but really, it's just a bloody passion. Right? And we're still in the same problem with the same decadent, bloody passions, only with reason acting as sort of a placebo. Right. So, the next section, since turning reason into a tyrant was the problem with Socrates, right? what Nietzsche turns to in the next section, called Reason in Philosophy, is two idiosyncrasies with regard to how philosophers reason. Right? They're fairly simple ones, and the next video won't be 42 minutes long. Um, I should be able to do it fairly quickly. All right.